Reforming Church, which means this meeting is being recorded. This means no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. There are several announcements this morning. Social Justice Group meet. You're muted, Evelyn. Evelyn, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's fine. There you go. Sorry, I was I was not muted, and then I got muted. We, in the... we are out of practice here in the sanctuary, and Suzanne muted everybody to make sure we yep. were muted, and Matt <laughs> muted you. So exactly. <laughs> I thought about that. Maybe would happen. All right. So what have you heard so far? <laughs> Anything? No. Okay. We heard social justice. That was the last thing before you got muted. Okay. Thank you. Aging with Grace will meet tomorrow at eleven, and. Mostly it'll be Zoom, I think. <laughs> that hasn't been decided. Uh, the potluck on Saturday, May 13th, potluck in a movie. That's tentative based on whether we have good numbers next week. Um, same thing with blanket making on Friday the 12th, 9.30 to 2.30. CPR training. There are still some openings for the afternoon session which will not be held unless we get at least six people signed up. Uh, the morning session is still good. Dress a Girl So Day has been rescheduled for June 3rd from 8.30 to 2.30. And we have some new accessibility initiatives. Thank you, Tim, for your hard work on this. Um, we've invested in the new hearing assistance system that allows you to use your own device or something from our church. And there are posters at both entrances that will give you more details. If you need more information and help, please see Tim when we next gather. Um, the other thing that you can actually take advantage of right now is we have closed captioning that comes with our Zoom membership. Tim found that out while he was on a conference. Thank you very much. Um, you go down to the bottom of your screen and you should see CC and it'll print out what's being said as long as we're using a microphone. Um, today is life of the church worship. And my initial plan was to discuss having a new perspective by trying a different seat in the congregation. So obviously this morning we all have different seats. Well, different from what, where we were last week in church. So give it some consideration and think about the fact that if you always sit in pew 17 or you always sit in pew three, try a different one. You might meet some new people if you need to introduce yourself. That's part of being welcoming. So please consider it in the future. And we still need musicians and vocalists and instrumentalists to perform during the offertory. And um, Marion Lowe goes away during the summer. So she could use some people being worship assistants. So please consider those possibilities. And now I'm going to turn it back to Tim. Thank you. us be in a time of worship, just breathe in deeply in our own spaces, exhale gently to the safety of those around you. I'm vamping while Suzanne lights the lighter. There we go. And let us welcome the light of Christ among us here in the sanctuary and at home. If you have a candle that you'd like to light, please do so at this time. And if you would remain muted, but join Amy and I in the opening hymn, Come My People. Come my people. 
my people, welcome to worship. Love is in the warmth of this place. Sing to God a song of thanksgiving. Sing to God a song of praise. Gather in safety, welcomed in Christian love. God touches us with strength from above. Come, my people, welcome to worship. Love is in the warmth of this place. Sing to God a song of thanksgiving. Sing to God a song of praise. Stories of Jesus show us the way to live how to serve others, how to forgive. Come, my people, welcome to worship. Love is in the warmth of this place. Sing to God a song of thanksgiving. Sing to God a song of praise. Stand with each other in one community working together God's reign to see come my people welcome to worship love is in the warmth of this place sing to God a song of thanksgiving sing to God a song of praise Amen. Thank you, Tim. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the intersection with eyes wide open. Ask where the ancient paths lead. Ask where the good way is. Walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. This morning's uh, prayers of the people, um, what I'd like you to do is I have a couple prayers, and then if you also have a prayer, if you could unmute yourself, let us know what that prayer request is, uh, and then mute yourself again. That would be great. The wonderful, another additional uh, wonderful thing about having the closed caption is it's also included as in part of the recording. So the good news is, is I don't have to try to type on my keyboard while I'm also trying to do six other things. And what I'll do is I'll just take the transcript of the closed captioning and clean that up a little bit and be able to send out the prayer requests. So yay for that. Yay for that as well. I have a couple other prayers. First and foremost, prayers of healing uh, to wholeness for the many members of this community, both known and unknown probably to me, uh, who have tested positive for COVID over this past week. Uh, prayers that we are able to be back together next week, which I'm sure we will be able to. In the meantime, as you are all going through your periods of isolation, enjoy the weather. I think the, the weather looks like it's going to be spectacular this week, so that's exciting. Uh, prayers for the victims, loved ones, bystanders, and responders of this week's um, mass shooting here in the United States, that our local, state, and federal politicians will help bring about change in this country that will focus on limiting who has access to these guns and what kind of guns can be purchased, where and how. Those are the prayers of concern and celebration I have this morning. Um, again, if there are others, please unmute yourself and let us know what those prayer requests are. Don Tordoff, continue prayers for Joe Dubriansky. Good. Lynn Garland, um, prayers of rejoicing, seeing our Hummers at the um, backyard. <laughs> Lee Jones, very thankful for all the cards and prayers that, that I have received from you. <laughs> it's very heartwarming. Thank you. I'm healing. Uh, continued prayers for my sister, Patsy, who remains in hospice care. Cindy Bradley, uh, 
Prayers for the family of Reverend Alden Blake. Alden passed on this past Tuesday, and um, his wife, Carol Ann, is a very special person to me. I have a prayer of joy for the members of Focus. Uh, Tricky Trey this week raised over, well, it was about $9,900, about $1,000 more than they've ever raised at a tricky tray that, as they put it, didn't have a car up for, for bid. Um, so $9,900 going directly to schools, other community programs, et cetera, in the greater Deerfield area. Um, this is Leslie Raymond. I have a prayer of joy for my husband not having a serious problem with his knee. It seems to only be a tissue tear and he's doing much better. So thank you for your prayers. Hearing um, and seeing no other prayer requests, let's pray together. Gosh, this is a trip, isn't it? We haven't had to do this in over a year. Can I just pause and say that for a second? Oh, Okay, let's pray together. God of resurrection, hear our prayers. For the church throughout the world, that all who profess to honor the risen Lord may be faithful in their witness and courageous in, in their testimony to the way of Jesus. For the governments of the world and its leaders, especially the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, Sudan, and wherever the systemic violence of warfare has overrun the population, we pray that the nations may dwell in peace, that goodwill will prevail over strife, and people of faith may freely worship as their hearts direct. For rain and sun in proper measure, and for abundant food and water for all who dwell upon the earth, for the sick and those in need, and for any who are oppressed by wounded by wounds of the soul. For our neighbors, that we may live together in amity, and that strangers among us may find us to be hospitable friends. For our enemies, that their sins may be forgiven them, just as we ask ours to be forgiven us, that all may find your peace. Almighty God, your Son promised to grant whatever we ask in his name. By your Holy Spirit, empower us to minister to the world as his faithful disciples, that our work may testify to what we pray and show forth your eternal glory through Jesus Christ, in whom we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, during this morning, this offering this morning, um, we do ask a reminder, uh, just to remind you that there are ways that you can give to the church, um, even though we are meeting in this way. One way to do that is to um, go to our website and click on the donate button, um, and you can actually say specifically where you would like that money to go how, and how much money you'd like to donate. You can do that as a one-time gift. Um, and you can also wait until next week, too. That's that's up to you. Um, but let us give ourselves an opportunity to hear the music that Amy has prepared for us this morning. Thank you. 
Let's pray the prayer of dedication. Holy God, we acknowledge receipt of the blessings you bestow upon us every day. We are grateful enough to return a portion of them back to you. We pray you use them for your work. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. We now come to the time of our worship service where is the message for all ages. Jennifer, are you here this morning? <laughs> With so many people on, I can't. See. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Um, go good. Okay. Um, well, I uh, I was like, this is weird. When Kurt said it's been a year since we've met like this, this is weird. But I did not mind rolling out of bed like five minutes before church. So um, hopefully you all had an opportunity to enjoy the little perk that is church this morning, uh, this format, even though it's uh, not for a great reason. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you this morning about um, something that we probably most of us have now in our cars and on our phones, right? Which is uh, GPS. Gone are the days, right, where we need to roll out a paper map or an atlas to get where we're going. So our GPS in my car, for some reason, many years ago, my children named Jane. I don't know why. I don't know if you all have named your GPS or not. You should consider it. You know, she does a lot for you. And so she deserves a name. So ours is named Jane. And so every now and then, Jane does things that we just we don't understand why she's done the things she does and why she steers us the way she does. And um, every now and then it's pretty frustrating. Like we went on vacation uh, many years ago. Um, we rented a house on the Cape and we used Jane the whole time. Jane rode right along with us and we got it's it was this old camp. So all these, um, you know, these all these old little um camp roads little dirt roads right so it's like a left three houses a right three houses a left three houses, and it's so it's um right in the middle of a four-way intersection jane said you've arrived at your destination we had not arrived at our destination we were in the middle of an intersection so we were like oh jane what what have you done right so we carry on and she says recalculating and she finds us and our way and one time we were up north and uh jane was a little bit yeah. off and uh tried to get us to turn into Storyland when we were trying to drive by which my kids thought was pretty funny and they were like jane wants us to go to Storyland, so who are we to argue with jane but uh you know we kept going but there's more times that i give Jane a hard time, then she gives me a hard time. So I'll plug in on my GPS. Hey, I want to go to, uh, you know, Shaw's. And, um, you know, maybe I know how to get there already, but I'm coming from a different place or whatever. And so Jane's like, all right, go down this road. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I know that if I go right, it's a shortcut, right? So I'm going to go right. I'm going to ignore the directions. And what does Jane do? It goes, she goes, do, 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 rerouting finds me a different way or recalculating finds me a different way. I'm going to get to where I'm going, but it's probably a little frustrating for Jane that I ask her opinion and then don't listen to it. Um, yeah. So here's the thing though. Sometimes my GPS is sending me a different way because there's an obstacle. So even though I might've gone the same way a hundred times, my GPS is telling me to go a different way to avoid um, you know, a car accident, a traffic jam for whatever reason, etc. And so ultimately, Jane knows where she's taking me because that's her job as my GPS is to take me where I'm going. And um, if I could just follow her, it would have gotten me into much less trouble uh, many times when I got stuck in a traffic jam that she tried to get me to go around and I just didn't listen. Um, and our relationship certainly with, uh, with God can be like that, right? God, Jesus is pointing us in the right direction, is, is inviting us to follow, inviting us to follow. And sometimes we just think we know a better route. But ultimately, um, the more that we can choose to say, okay, who knows better here? We're going to try out our way. Let's 
you know, ultimately we keep coming back to the path. We keep coming back to Jesus. And um, so as you go along thinking, you know, one thing, uh, I hope that you're open to um, follow what, where Jesus is pointing you and listen to the things that he's telling you to do. And, um, you know, don't get in your own way. <laughs> so um, let's be in prayer. God, we're so blessed to always be invited to follow you. No matter the decisions we make, if they're on the path that we should have been on or not, always there's a chance to just recalculate ourselves and turn back to you. And we thank you for the opportunity to consider all the things that we know and all the things that we think we know and work together with you uh, towards the life that we know you want us to have. Amen. And thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Leslie Raymond, thank you so much for agreeing to read this morning. Uh, this morning's scripture lesson comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Whenever you're ready. You are so welcome. I look at GPS as God's personal service. So yeah. <laughs> I don't argue. I don't argue with my GPS. <laughs> Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. <clears throat> if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to the Lord, show us the father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the father and the father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I go to the father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. May God bless his holy words. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we now open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to listen to you. Please speak to us and give us your word, for we cannot live on bread alone. Please light up our insides with the work of the living Holy Spirit. We pray this and so much more in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On this fifth Sunday of Easter, it may be hard for us to reflect on the transformative power of resurrection when we find ourselves yet again amid another surge of COVID in our community of faith. Though the setting of the scripture seems appropriate this morning. Jesus has just finished a last supper with his disciples. He has washed their feet given them a new commandment, predicted Peter's denial, foretold Judas's betrayal, and told his friends that he is about to leave them. 
Where I am going, he tells them, you cannot follow now. Needless to say, the words sting and fill the bewildered disciples with fear. What is Jesus talking about? How will they go on without him? Where will they go? What will happen to their cherished plans? Why is the ground shifting under their feet? Why is everything changing? If it's true that, as the ancient Greek philosopher, Her philosopher Heraclitus taught us that change is the only constant in life, it's also important to acknowledge that change can also be scary. Sometimes the change that is required is not something that we ask for, nor does it come at a convenient time. For example, over the past few months, primarily due to my cancer diagnosis and removal of the tumor in my neck that has left my throat numb and vocal cords tighter, I've come to the conclusion that I can no longer lead singing in worship. This is a realization I've come to accept, and over the coming weeks, we'll see how this church, with its amazing depth of musical talent and energy, will help us worship God in different musical ways. Aging with grace is not just something those of us who are over 65 and retired need to contemplate. Changing occurs throughout the life cycle. One minute you're concerned about the well-being of your favorite stuffed animal, blankie, your toy, and the next you're dealing with the hormonal changes that are accompanied by zits and a lowering of your voice. Moving out and learning to live individually, learning to live in relationship to an intimate someone, learning to live with people you are called to help raise, learning to live as an empty nester, and sometimes learning to re, uh, le needing to relearn living with children who need to come back home. Learning to prioritize and compartmentalize life into personal, professional, and social realms, and learning how to live with purpose into retirement. Most of the time, change is a good thing. This is especially true when we are flexible and open to change and willing to actively engage in change. Indeed, perhaps all of life is measured by our ability to embrace change rather than run from it or fight it. Rather than react to change by either fight or flight or freeze or fawn, which are the four stress responses to change, perhaps another response to change is faith, which is to say that change can best be responded to by bravely embracing change, doing whatever it is that you have to do, faithfully trusting the entire organization, whether that be family or business or church, or social group, to engage and enact change together. Maybe that's the only way. That's certainly the kind of faith Jesus had in the disciples, and it's the kind of faith he asked the disciples to have in one another. The disciples must have been wondering, who's going to be leading us now? Perhaps they wondered this because they weren't remembering all the times Jesus reminded them of their own capacity to enact change. Among these reminders was the comment he made here in this morning's scripture lesson. Listen up, he says. Anyone who believes in me will do far more greater things than I have ever done because you all are sticking around and I'm going to God. This isn't good enough for the anxiety-ridden disciples. They want certainty. They must have also forgotten that hope resides in uncertain uncertainty. Certitude kills creativity. Certainty is the enemy of growth. Thomas 
asks Jesus for a roadmap. How can we know the way? Philip asks for proof. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. What they want, what we all want, if we're honest, is a religion with an unerring GPS. We want the tidy five-point plan to success. We want the clarity of the 12-step program. We want the simple directness of the Ten Commandments, whose best translations from the ancient Hebrew read like, you, no kill, you, no steal, and you, no other gods. I'm convinced, I'm convinced this is the case because, quite honestly, we sometimes act like toddlers when confronted by divine will. Do these things, and you will most assuredly reach your goal. Jesus' response, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you know me, you will know God also. No satellite, no master plan, no PowerPoint presentation, just Jesus. Just the messy, intimate, ever-evolving, and often confusing business of relationship, of trust, patience, and perhaps above all, vulnerability. If you had asked me at the time I had graduated from Andover Newton and wrote that 25-page ordination paper to describe what Christian life is supposed to look like, I would have handed you the receipts of my knowledge. I would have told you that I was prepared, good to go, ready, and that whatever I may be may have missed, I also would trust that it would come along the way. Alas, the virus of certitude is more easily caught coming out of the academy. Remember when you were in eighth grade and you thought you knew everything? Graduated from high school and you thought you knew everything? Graduated from college and you thought you knew everything? You thought you knew everything until just two and a half months later, literally two and a half months later, you were confronted with the reality that there was so much more that you didn't know and that you needed to learn. The reality is this. If I were to read my ordination paper today, which I will confess to you, I have never done since, since I presented it at my ecclesiastical council, I'd have wondered who wrote it. The reality of the changes in my theology since 2006 can be described as a series of saying goodbye to the God I thought I once knew and continuously meeting God anew. I came to the realization that in order for me to know God, I would have to unknow God. I would have to replace old wineskins with new. I would have to drop the sanctity of my own beliefs and emerge naked, vulnerable, and new over and over and over again. This gets decidedly more difficult when there are people in your life who look to you as the fount of all wisdom and knowledge. I have found that there is far more strength and wisdom in saying, I have no clue. Let's find out together. Like the disciples in this morning's scripture lesson, we may come to the realization that change in life, the way station of death, and the resurrection, transformation, rebirth that comes after trauma, whether that be physical, psychological, spiritual, emotional, mental, or cognitive, it's not easy. We may have difficulty coming to a place of acceptance in a God who we've come to know in one way, beside us, with us, of us, and trust in the power of a God as declared by Jesus, who is now in us. As the disciples were struggling to wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus was telling them that he would not be with them for much longer, at least in the way they were used to having him around, perhaps the struggle is real for us too. 
What are some of the gods you're struggling to let go of? Here are some of mine. A god who's transactional. Do this and get rewarded. Do that and get punished. In other words, to receive anything from God, I must fir first give something to God. A karmic God. One who believes that God will judge us based on our words and deeds, which, of course, negates the entire concept of grace and mercy. I'm always trying to get rid of the God who guarantees the safety and well-being of all. A God who prevents all violence, saves all children, brings peace to all, eliminates terror, and staves off death. The God who gives me satisfactory answers when things go wrong. As much as I would like to believe it, I'm trying to shake off a God who makes faith easy. A God who provides easy answers to complex problems. A God who erases doubts. A God who comes when I pray and goes away when I'm fed up. I'm shaking off the notion that I am less than if I don't consciously feel the total, complete presence of God in my life 24-7. Or maybe it feels like a tall order right now to not let your hearts be troubled. I know that's something that's true for me. To trust that we do, in fact, know the way. The quiet, unassuming, unglorious, risky, but ultimately life-giving way of Jesus. But we do. Like Thomas, like Philip, like Peter. Like the others, we know Jesus. We know his life. We know his love. We know his death. We know his resurrection. We know what it is to hunger for him, to seek him, to listen for him, to hope in him. We know the way. Perhaps the way isn't what we thought it was going to be. The way is demanding. The way is precarious. The way takes time. But the invitation of this gospel is still an invitation to faithful trust, not because we're experts at finding God, but because God will always and has already found us. With every unknowing we embrace, God finds us one more time. In God's house, there are many dwelling places, Jesus tells his sorrowing disciples, meaning this, God is roomy, God is generous, God is hospitable, God is welcoming. God can handle our doubts, our fears, and our questions. And God's offer of belonging extends far beyond the confines of this mortal life. I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says. Excuse me. As he stands in the shadow of his own cross. You have a place with me. You have a place with God. You have a place. It is a relatively dark setting with real questions, an offer of comfort, a promise of home, and a pointing of the way. This is a gospel for our time, the story. Our collective story in this messy world does not end in death, because through Jesus, death is dead and gone. The way is open before us. We know it. We know Jesus. And because we know Jesus, we know God. The way will safely bear us home. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Please mute yourself, and if you've not already done that, and join in singing our closing hymn, When in Our Music God is Glorified. When in our music
sick Lord is glorified and adoration leaves no room for pride it is as though the whole creation cried hallelujah how often making music we have found a new dimension in the world of sound as worship moved us to a more profound So has the church in liturgy and song, in faith and love through centuries of wrong, borne witness to the truth in every tongue. and be tuned for praise let all rejoice who have a voice to raise and may god give us faith to sing always Friends, go forth into the world in peace. Serve the Lord God, love your neighbor. Love the Lord God and serve your neighbor. May Jesus Christ's grace, God's love, and the Holy Spirit's guidance be with you now and eternally. Amen.